My main issue with this and every other discussion about it is that we are trying to construct a narrative about the past. And when you're trying to construct a narrative about the past, and especially one that's as prehistoric as this, and especially, especially one that isn't necessarily created to control maliciously, that we are creating a story to explain the stories that were created to explain the world. And so we need to have some humility about that. You are listening to the Down the Wormhole podcast, exploring the strange and fascinating relationship between science and religion. This week, our hosts are... Rachel Jackson, rabbi at Agudas Israel Congregation in Hendersonville, North Carolina. And if I had to choose between being a country mouse and a city mouse, I would most certainly choose to be a country mouse. The city is too loud, too congested, too devoid of nature. Zach Jackson, UCC pastor in Reading, Pennsylvania. And between a city mouse and a country mouse, I'm definitely a country mouse, except a country mouse with, like, Wi-Fi. Ian Benz, uh, associate professor of elementary science education at UNC Charlotte, and I'd say between the two, probably country mouse, because I feel like I could run free in the fields, and of course not get eaten, because I will be like a spy. I think there's more predators out in the fields of the country, though. Yeah, but I'm a spy, so they can't see me. (laughs) <laughs> it's not how predators work. It is in my <laughs> sure in they my can. world. <laughs> <laughs> in the world in which you are a mouse. Oh, That's okay. correct. So we've already. Uh, okay, we can go there. <laughs> okay. In fantasy land, yes. predators aren't predators. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> okay, just just making sure. Marvelous. Well, the reason I wanted to start out with that question is because in our society, we use populations to sort of understand cultures, right? So there's a particular culture that happens when you live in the city, um, whatever city that might be. And there's a different culture when you live in the country. And I have intentionally excluded suburbs because that's a very new phenomenon. (laughs) So that that not included in this conversation. So when we look at these concepts and say, okay, how much do you know your neighbors? How much do you interact with them? How many different people do you interact with on a daily or weekly or routine basis that you can say, I know this person and I either trust or distrust or, you know, look at them, look at them with a shady eye and that's sort of an aid in our social beings, right? We, as we've discussed before, human evolution is taking us from a primate standpoint, right? As we heard from Brianna. And we will know that from our primate standpoint, primates are very, very social beings and all of the different hominins are also quite social, The question is, how big is our social group and how does that impact our relationships with one another? So I want to eliminate the overwhelming majority of human existence and bring us all the way down to homo homo sapiens, which are categorized about 50,000 years ago. Again, as we've as we've been talking about through this miniseries. So focusing it down directly down to the homo sapiens. Now, homo sapiens did not necessarily leave us really big clues. There wasn't a a New York City that we could go find through the through archaeological evidence. So, we have a lot of really good science to try to figure out how many people lived together in in groups during this homo sapien times. And so there's some data that says even during that time, the Homo sapiens, one of the reasons that they bested the Neanderthal peoples is because they were able to have larger societies. This is one going theory. And the larger the society, and when you have competing resources, quantitatively, that people wins out. 
or the, that group wins out. And so that's how we've sort of dominated over the Neanderthals in shared spaces. But it really isn't until the end of the Ice Age, which is about 12,000 years ago, give or take, that we really start seeing very large groups of people inhabiting the same space. It's around the same time that we see agricultural peoples where they are, uh, we've domesticated our wheat and we've domesticated other crops and we've really become a firm settlement as opposed to hunter gatherers and foragers. Um, there is some evidence that about 25,000 years ago, there is a, a permanent settlement, but they're, they're few and far between and they're still quite small up until again, about 12,000 years ago. So what we have is we see a convergence between the growth of the population size of societies We're seeing a development of agriculture and the end of an ice age. And then we start to see, again, from some archaeological evidence, the existence of a moralistic God. And so one of the questions that we have is, what came first? And it's not nearly as simple as the question of which came first, the chicken or the egg, because it's not based in DNA, it's based in society. And so we have to use evidence to try to figure out which of these came first. There was an article in um, Nature Magazine, I believe, that talks about, and any articles that we quote today will certainly be in our show notes as well as other fun factoids, that is looking at how do we know? Is it, and they used a great title, you know, big gods or big cities, which came first? And so before we go into the article itself and other topics, I wanted to just sort of ask Ian and Zach today their understanding of this concept, big gods uh, and big cities, really a moralistic god as opposed to more of a... uh, Ritualistic? Not necessarily ritualistic. I was more thinking uh, not necessarily uh, interaction, right? A God who deals with our interaction, our pro-social norms, right? But a God who- The God who cares about social norms. Right, exactly. The God as opposed to gods who care about rain, gods who care about- you know, weather patterns and fertility and um, basic life needs sure. as opposed to basic social needs, right? so finding the difference. The uh, That distinction is not quite as clear, though. I mean, there are certainly places and times where it seems like the growth of a big city is the same time as the growth of a god that cares about moral values above all else. Uh, but it's not always the case. The Greek religion even during the, the the high watermarks of of the Greek city states, I mean, those gods didn't care a lick about how you lived your life. If you if you stole something or killed someone, I mean, Zeus didn't care. Zeus was probably doing the same thing somewhere off there <laughs> in between impregnating random women and animals, and the gods were nuts. You don't see gods caring about the moral behavior of humans until the rise of of Plato and and the philosophers and before that they're just concerned about you know getting their sacrifice and if you get the sacrifice in and you do the right thing in that way ritualistically then you're free to do whatever you want after that meanwhile in Mesopotamia that's not the case those gods mm-hmm. care about the way that you live morally speaking they're concerned about social hegemony. And I I don't know how much of that has to do with the way that the Greeks developed as these separate city-states, as opposed to one singular group like the the Assyrians or Babylonians or whatnot. It's just one example of a time where moralistic gods don't rise at the same time as big cities. And one of the things that I have found really interesting um, is something that referred to as Dunbar's number. Are you familiar with this? I just read something a little bit about it yesterday, but not very familiar with it. So the gist of it is that there is uh, there's an anthropologist, Robin Dunbar, who proposed a correlation 
between the brain size of primates, specifically the neocortex, and average social size. So found that there is some correlation between the size of the primate's brain and the amount of fellow primates in their primary tribe, as it were. Is that causative? You know, that's where the debate is, that correlation does not equal causation. But by studying 48 different, I think it was 48 different species of, of primates and trying to find a, an equation based on that, to be able to predict how large a social group should be based on the size of a primate's brain, then applied that to humans, the Homo sapiens, and found the number to be roughly 148. 148 people, it is comfortable to be in your tribe. Right. So then he went through, this was in the early 90s, and so then Dunbar went through hunter-gatherer societies around the world today and looking at historical records and archaeological records, avoiding the big cities and looking out into the, the smaller communities that we have found and found that roughly that's kind of the case, that if humans are left to their own devices, we generally tend to gather together in groups of about 150. And I'll tell you, from a pastor's perspective, I get this. Every church I've been a part of that's growing when it reaches about 150 or so, 120, 130, 140, it tends to hit a plateau. You grow really quickly until you hit that point, and then at that point, it stops. And then if you can get past that, then you grow quickly again. But there is just something about that many people where after you get that many people, it gets really hard to build relationships anymore. Like our brains are only capable of being connected to that many people, and then the only way to get past that is to then have a a meta narrative that everyone can get around, and so that can it's I, not. Can I interrupt just, real quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah please interrupt. Sorry. I'm trying to remember what that number, and you may have already said it. And I was looking for something related to our discussion, but is that like that number is in a particular? So we all have different communities, right? You have your church community, you may have your work community, and stuff. Like, is that all encompassing? The idea is with that number, the Dunbar number, is this like your whole life? Or is that so the idea pockets? is that that if people are just in a space, they tend to gather in groups of 150. Okay. Trying to apply that the way that our social brains have evolved to our crazy connected overpopulated world is where the the tricky bit comes in. Because technology yeah. is kind of a story that's helped us to increase that that level. I'm sitting here talking to you two whom I met in New York City, and we are now states apart. And we're going to send this out over the internet to a couple hundred people that, some of which we've never met, and we're kind of creating our own social group. So we're breaking yeah. some of those built-in norms, which makes it difficult. Uh, it makes it hard on us physically in terms of brain capacity to be able to do that. I, I feel like you can have about 150 close, not close, close relationships, but f familial relationships mm -hmm. across your various circles with church and work and home and neighborhood and all of that. It gets hard to remember people's names after that. And if you were trying to have one cohesive group more than 150, you have to have a compelling narrative to keep them together. Dunbar's number of about 150. And I'm unfamiliar with the concept that, that he's putting forward, so maybe you can help. What makes people, what, what made that narrative happen? What made somebody or some group say, we're willing to come up with a narrative, or we have this narrative, therefore join us? Right. That that's what broke that barrier for someone. Right. We recognize that we can break it because we have the access and the ability to. But somebody laid the groundwork for us. somebody. Somebody had larger cities. Somebody decided to make a government happen. 
right? Because in order to have, and maybe that's maybe that's the narrative, right? Maybe it's our 200 versus your 100 because we now have a uh, political and social structure that you don't, right? But I, I'm wondering like what, what made that shift happen in our ancestors? Something that they all mutually wanted, I would think. Like you've got 150 people that can be supported by each other and 200 people over here, 100 people over there. And they've got seashells over there. They're close to the shore. They've got gorgeous seashells. And then further in, they've got these amazing jewels and rocks from the mountains. And we think that they're pretty great. And so we're able to join together in trade based on this narrative, this story of commerce. Commerce is a story just as much as national identity is a story. Everything about us is a story in our society. I mean, how how meaningless is the whole financial system entirely? Did I have I ever told this story on here about my experience in Target that one day recently? I believe. Uh, I think so. Which which one was it again? Uh, yeah, um, we're. <laughs> so I I put this up on Facebook. So I, I don't remember. I think who that's was. where I saw it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, this is the moment that I was struck by the absurdity of the financial system that wow. I had to go shopping before um, before my psychiatrist appointment and I had to get some stuff for dinner. And I this is the only time I had to go shopping. I didn't have any time afterwards. I had all this church stuff coming and I got to get my boy and all this. So I ran to Target and I got the stuff, real stuff, real physical stuff that we're going to put in our bodies to survive. Just put that out there. This is real, real stuff. <laughs> and I do go through the self-checkout because the one person who's working and the, the other one is, is backed up. And I get to the end and realize I forgot my wallet at home. My wallet has my debit card and all of my other means of payment. So I can't pay. But I realize, ooh, it's 2019. I have my phone. Certainly I can do something with this. I had Samsung Pay before, but then I realized I had gotten a new phone and so the cards didn't transfer over and I would need to call my bank to then validate the cards in Samsung pay to make the thing work. But I didn't have time for that. And so I'm trying to figure out other ways that I can pay. And I thought, well, maybe I can pay through target app and you can, but you have to have one of their credit cards and then you'd have to apply for a credit card and no. So how about Google pay? Well, that's great, but I have to input my credit cards and I don't have my credit cards to input into. <laughs> right. Google right. Pay. So eventually I, I realized that I could connect my PayPal account with Samsung Pay. <laughs> and all I had to do was answer some emails and a text message. And so eventually I had ended up paying and this this uh, attendant there was just having a ball watching me. And then when I finally paid, she was just, she clapped for me. And I know that all of these stories on the internet always end with, and everyone clapped, but this time I actually, actually did get <laughs> clapped at. But what I, the absurdity of it really struck me because here I was with bags filled with food, which a person needs to live, real stuff. And I took my phone and I tapped it on, which by the way, it's just a magical rectangle. And I tapped it on a box at Target and it vibrated. And then it said, you've paid. And what that did was that that target, target sent a signal to Samsung to give over money to them. Samsung said, I don't, I don't got no money. Let's call PayPal. And they called PayPal. And PayPal said, well, I don't have any money. Let's, let's pull it from their bank. And my bank said, sure, he's got a whole bunch of numbers in here. And they gave some of the numbers through all of those different intermediaries. And how did I get those numbers in my account? I got those numbers because my church valued my time and gave me a piece of paper with some numbers on it and somebody's squiggly handwriting. And I have a credit union that's not around here. So I took a picture of that piece of paper with numbers on it and I texted it to my bank and they said, well, that's good enough. We'll put some more numbers in your bank account. And we'll take those numbers from the church's numbers, which they had gotten from people on Sunday mornings giving pieces of paper and also writing numbers on pieces of paper to the church. And their banks had done the same thing. And so this whole process, just turning different numbers and sending them through different institutions, nothing actually happened except <laughs> some permission to, to do some math. So I gave permission for some computers to do math and I got... You got um, dinner. Dino nuggets. 
right? And <laughs> the entire process of that is absurd. In I mean, This is the basis of Kurt Vonnegut's book, Galapagos. Society collapses because everyone realizes how ridiculous money is and how it's not actually worth anything. And then the whole world ends. But that happens very early on in the book, so I didn't spoil anything. It's such a human endeavor, this story of commerce, because there's no better way. I mean, the, the Phoenicians realized this early on, that this was the only way to have cross-national trade uh, across the Mediterranean, was to have precious metals that were stamped in a certain way that gave value to it, that you could trust that government had done it, and you could trust the government to have done it, whereas an individual might have tried to you know mess you over a little bit. And it's the most human thing to do to create a story that we all can agree with mm -hmm. so that we can live our lives. I'm not saying we should go back to a barter economy, but it's absurd and it's so human. And it's one of the ways that we get past our Dunbar's number. And I think the word that you used when you were telling at the very end of, the, of your story is the word trust, right? That, uh, that at the creation of commerce, in ter is, as opposed to bartering, is because one person trusted another person that this was a valuable thing to trade and to uh, make an easy transaction for things. Mm -hmm. But it's establishing that trust that I think is so crucial that we can actually see that in place and in various in various other cultures around the globe that are that are trying to set up a commerce system. How right or moving beyond a a local a local barter system to a close barter system, right? I how am I going to tell you that I will deliver you 50 chickens and you believe me, right? Because you and I have never met. And, and it's creating that trust that I think is, is the challenge that we have when we try to push beyond our, our local community, whether that community uh, fits Dunbar's number or not. And we, we still have that, that need to trust, whether it's corporations, um, Right, the the person at at Target in your example was trusting that you weren't just gonna take the food and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'll pay you later. Right, mm -hmm. you know I'm good for it. Actually, we don't trust you. We don't. We we need your numbers before I can trust you and say you're gonna come back with your wallet tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Right, so we've actually lost a bit of that trust and gave it over to entities that just push numbers back and forth. Yeah. Well, and the hypothesis in this article that you mentioned and in others that will be in the show notes that spurned this conversation are that a big God who who cares about social norms and will punish you for violating said social norms is how we ended up with big cohesive st cities, right? That this is something that is one of the main points in the book Sapiens at God is a story told by people trying to hold together large groups. But what we don't often talk about is, is the written word yes. wasn't created yeah. to tell stories about God. The written word, for all intents and purposes, was, was created for accounting purposes. The oldest surviving parchment that we have, there's obviously there's carved tablets that are older, but the oldest parchment that we have is a spreadsheet. Yeah. It's an Egyptian <laughs> spreadsheet from like 4,500 years yeah. ago. Really? I, w yeah. I it's a spreadsheet. It's got, it's got the, the, the grid and all of that good stuff. It's basically Excel. It's the same exact format 4,000 years ago. And because that's why we invented 6, language. 6,000 years ago. Yeah. 6,000 years ago. 4,000 BC. Sorry. Right. <laughs> Um, math. <laughs> yeah, this is why we invented math. I mean, who needs we invented it? Right? Math for making buildings and for selling things. So commerce is really um, humanity's original religion, as far as I'm concerned. That moralistic gods and all of that. I mean, that's that's a discussion that we're going to have. But our first religion is money, and it's still our favorite god in America. Hey, 
So it seems like it was, you know, I don't know a whole lot about this particular topic other than what I read to prepare for today's episode, but it seems like to me, and I had listened to, and this is what I was looking up earlier, a podcast that was released on NPR's Hidden Brain um, mm. by uh, Good Shankar podcast. Vedantam. Shankar Vedantam. Yes, I will send the link yep. to you. Rachel, but it it was one that came out in 2018 and then re-released in uh, May of this year, of 2019. You know, where does religion come from? And I thought it was just so it made me think about that. I actually now I want to re-listen to it, but it was talking about this whole idea of where religion emerged from, you know, culturally. And it seemed like, based on my memory, that a lot of part, for lack of a better word, it was for control. If that makes sense, mm-hmm. you know, to kind of keep people in line again for an easy explanation mm-hmm. um yeah how do you keep people to in keep line communities don't know. yeah yeah keep communities functioning keep keep society moving forward if that makes sense yes it makes sense but my my main issue with this and every other discussion about it is that we are trying to construct a narrative about the past and when you're trying to construct a narrative about the past, and, essentially, and especially one that's as prehistoric as this, and especially, especially one that isn't necessarily created to control, like maliciously to control, that we are creating a story to explain the stories that were created to explain the world. And so <laughs> we need to have some humility about that. Yeah. I, this This was my issue with Sapiens, was that... It was just, it was very dogmatic. And this is exactly the reason why we have religion, exactly the reason why these were made. It's made to, to control people. It's made to expand our societies, to give us a common story we can believe in so that we can exist in big cities and that rulers can then manipulate people into being good people for fear of hell. And that's why the priests and everyone are these high people in society. All of that is a story that they have that they're telling that helps them to explain why there's this big prevalence of big cities and big religions. It's still a story. We don't see this happening in real time. And so we can't document it happening in real time. It's, it's just as, as possible that the two, the big city, the big God grew up together, that they influence each other um, or that, Big God revelations are the real thing and that they help to create cities. I mean, determining which is cause and effect or a third cause that's not a part of this is something that requires some humility because we're doing anthropology and not physics. Right. Well, so, but what about then the article from Nature that you referenced at the very beginning, Rachel? When I was reading some of the the resources to prepare for this, I was talking about issues around that particular article because I guess the article was arguing yes. that big city happened first and then big God. And I guess the idea originally was more of big gods happened before big cities. Is that right? Right. So I, I, from my understanding, the the common story that we tell, which is is sort of what Zach is saying, is that in order to grow a big city, you need to have a story in place which will keep people in line, and then the city can become much larger. Right, uh, as just a, a general understanding. What this what this particular group of people was trying to do is to say, oh, well, let me look at archaeological evidence because this is still prehistory is really what they were looking at. Prehistory meaning before they have written things down. Mm-hmm. And so we know that big cities existed prior to prior to writing, prior to, to literate cultures. And so there's a database called the Shishat Databank which is really the crux of the challenge. So in the scientific community, there's this idea of garbage in, garbage out. So whatever you tell it are the the variables and the factors and the answers. You're then going to get out the answers that it, the numbers that it crunches based on mm-hmm. only what you put in. And so the challenge is that this this particular database slices things in 100 year parts. 
right? Century, century markers, which on the one hand seems like a long time. On the other hand, it doesn't seem that very long at all to create a, a city or uh, to change a community's theology. So, so that's one, that's one piece. A second piece is how, how is the data vetted? How is it verified? And then the third, the third challenge is what do you do with the absence of data? Right. Right. So if uh, there's another way of framing it, the argument from silence, we don't have the data. So does that mean it didn't exist then or just that we simply don't have the data? Right. So can we say for certain that something did not happen because we have no evidence of it? Or can we just say we have no evidence of it and therefore it might have happened or it might not have happened. Right, but we and can't that's determine been part of the challenge. Right, we can't make a we can't, solid yeah. solid conclusion because we just it just yeah. Right, and and if we have just gaps, right? I can give you one, two, three, five, six, seven. You could probably fill in the gap. Like, oh, that should be a four. Right, mm-hmm. you have enough evidence that I'm counting by single digits, and there's seem right, and I'm going in order. That seems very fair. But what if I said one, three, one, two, three, five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven, thirteen, right? Now I'm giving you a different pattern. Now I'm sort of saying, I just don't like the number four and its factors. <laughs> I just don't like them. So I'm not going to use them. I'm intentionally excluding them. Right. And and that's that we don't know because again, we are Attempting to create a narrative, as Zach was saying, we're attempting to create a narrative based on lack of information. And so that was part of the conversation. That's that's part of the um, the challenge with this article that came out in Nature. And and the article in Nature was saying that it believes that big cities came first and then big gods came later. That this idea of, no, let's just create a society and what happens with our theology and therefore religion comes afterward. Mm, and right. then there were several professional rebuttals saying, actually, I don't agree with the data that you've input or or a different rebuttal was I don't agree with your conclusion based on my inputting uh, slightly different data. Right. So if you if you just continue and say not applicable, not applicable, or does not exist, and then, oh, suddenly it exists, it changes how you interpret the the same set of data, which is sort of what we've talked about in other scientific realms, that the data is just data. It's our interpretation of it that also really matters. And so there were a few rebuttals that said, actually, the way I interpret the data, if you move, if you move the line just a little bit, big gods still came before big right. society. And so we're actually in this in this sort of scientific community in the same place as we were before this. But I think it's a really important important look because as we are trying to construct a narrative of religion, which I believe is the purpose of this question. Where did it come from? How did we get to a place of changing theology from, as we've talked about before, from a Venus figure, from praying about fertility to a place of an afterlife, to a place of deep rituals, whether they be sacrifices or other prayerful rituals. How did we get there? And how many people needed to be involved in order to get there? I think that's that's what we're trying to get to. And we just don't have, from my perspective, we just don't have enough actual evidence to make those very complex questions. How how do we make those, those judgment calls? Um, I think it's a very valuable question, and I'm glad that people are looking into it. I just don't think, I think the question is too complex for us to come up with answers at this point. So you had mentioned at the beginning that when we start to see large groups of people gathering together and making these cities was around the agricultural revolution. And while that is true, we don't see large cities popping up all over the world during this time, even though there's agriculture Mm. all over the place. There's only big cities appearing in a couple of places. 
And the reason for that is that there's only a few types of animals that it's possible to domesticate. So it, it wasn't just the domestication of wheat and corn that created big cities. It's the domestication of sheep and fowl and oxen and llamas and alpaca. And if you look at the places where big cities existed, those are the places where there are animals that can be domesticated. The places like Sub-Saharan Africa, you can't, there there aren't animals there that you can domesticate. You can't train a zebra to pull a plow. <laughs> uh, it just won't, it won't listen. And that so would be cool, you can't though. have, right? And, and so in, in, you end up in these places in, in Europe, in the Middle East, and in uh, parts of Asia, where you have these big cities forming because there's animals to do the labor for you. And even in, in this hemisphere, the only places where there were big cities among the Native Americans were in Mexico, in, mm -hmm. in the Andes, in places where there were llamas and alpacas, because you can domesticate them and mm -hmm. later horses. You don't see big cities in Pennsylvania or uh, among the Lenape people, even the Iroquois, and you know, the North American tribes, because there was nothing up here. There used to be horses and camels, but we, we killed them off in the Stone Ages. And also from that comes bigger cities, because we have easier labor and more access to things like milk and meat, which are quick and, and efficient sources of protein and, and of calories. And we mentioned before, this is when lactose tolerance begins in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, you also get these more densely packed cities with more animals living among people with more filth. And so then you get plagues and all of the diseases mm. that have ravaged humanity, with the exception of malaria, come from animals, livestock that live in cities. So this is why when Europeans went to North America, we spread smallpox everywhere, but there was no America pox that got brought back to Europe because they didn't have big cities, so they didn't have big disease. And it also has led to um, filthy living conditions and a lot of the wars and the fighting and all of all of that, that thing that the industrial agricultural farming revolution that was supposed to make our lives so much better we end up actually working more hours than hunter-gatherer societies. These big cities that were supposed to bring art and philosophy and music and good things end up bringing disease and war. And while we're, humans always try to make the best of things, it turns out that all of these advancements just made us more miserable, which is how I read the first <laughs> couple of chapters in Genesis. I read that origin story as a as a um an iron age critique of the beginning of the bronze age i mean you think about what what happens with adam and eve they're happy they're living off of the off of the trees and bushes they're walking around they're getting food wherever they go they're hunter gatherers and what do they do they're naked they want knowledge Put that in there. They, they're naked. They want knowledge. So they go for the knowledge and the knowledge then curses them. And what is Adam's curse? Adam's curse is he has to, to then work farm. The land. He has to work the land. But then they have children. So the and sweat one... drips off his brow, his nose. So the sweat comes off his nose. It's right. very potent in the Hebrew. Yeah. Right. From the window to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> so the sweat drips down his brows. That is I think that's how an it goes in the song. Little John translation. <laughs> but then they have kids. And those kids, one kid is a farmer, so is an agricultural fella. And the other one is a shepherd, is somebody who is more of a nomadic person. And they both make sacrifices. And God likes the nomad more than God likes the this, this farmer. Mm -hmm. And we have to that point nowhere that God says, I want meat. They both bring the thing that they do. Mm -hmm. And God mm -hmm. looks at them and says, I don't like you. And what does Cain do? <laughs> Immediately, Cain resorts to violence because, because uh, agriculture leads to cities and cities lead to violence. And so Cain kills his brother, tries to hide the evidence. God, of course, finds out and then casts him out into the wilderness. 
And then what does Cain do? He makes a city. It's like the first thing he does with all of these other people that are apparently out there that don't, you know, why are there other people out there? I don't know. But he is connected with cities and agriculture all the time, and he is universally the bad guy. And then we get in Genesis 11, the the Babel, we get technology, technology of brick making so that we can be like God and we can build a city and a monument in the city, a tower that can reach up to God. Technology will make our cities better. And God says, nope, that's no good. And then Abraham, right? Abraham is living in the biggest city in the world at that time. And God says, nope, I want you to go out and I want you to wander and I want you to be nomads. And so I see the beginning of Genesis as a critique of that. This is a nomadic people, the being the, the, the Israelites at that time, when they're telling these stories, a nomadic people remembering life as herders and hunter-gatherers and lamenting the destruction that cities have caused. And they have a God who likes what they like, as we all do, right? I mean, they they... They, they try to build a temple for this God, and God goes, no, I like camping better. I don't I don't want to have one place to live. I want the whole earth to be my footstool. I want to live in a tent out in the wilderness. That's more my jam, because cities bring bad things. And so I I see this, this embedded critique, whether or not they meant it, or it was just a part of the zeitgeist. That we all somewhat understand that we should be country mice, and that city mice get fat and then get eaten by hawks. And it's much better out in the country. Yeah, you don't get fat and you get eaten much earlier. (laughs) Yay! (laughs) But that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's supposed to be. So if you want to... Please, no, no. No, go ahead, please. Um, No, the Christian just made a commentary on the Torah. And uh... (laughs) I I, I feel like there's a little bit of eisegesis going on there. Um, You're reading into the text what you want to see, which is fine. That's sort of what the whole purpose of Drosh is. And I, I I don't fully disagree with your assessment. I think it's a particular reading. I don't think it's the particular reading because we weren't there. Um, <laughs> as, as much as we try to try to think that we are, we we weren't there. As and and it sounds like you're saying early Genesis, which basically stops after Abraham. Because mm-hmm. I'm thinking of, I mean, poor Isaac. He's just got so much PTSD from trying to be sacrificed. So right? we we just give him we just give him a yeah. pass. Um so then we so then we get Jacob, right? Rebecca really held that. Rebecca really held that generation together and her. totally manipulated because if you look at her and who do we have, right? She has Jacob and Esau. Esau is the one of the land and Jacob is the one of the home, the more. And she's the one that turns she basically says through God, right? That the the younger will the elder will serve the younger. And there will be two nations, but Esau is the one that works the land and is the the hunter, and Jacob is the one that stays at home, and that's then where the population comes from. Mm-hmm. So, I I think that there's a bit of a a, a struggle there um, about which which one is preferred for the humans. So that that is one response. So to us, you know, this is really interesting. It's things I want to learn more about, and you know, as as we find more information on it, I'm I'm more and more fascinated by it. But I'm just curious to listeners when they hear things like this, you know, what are some takeaways for them? I guess about you know how this could in, impact their their beliefs or their culture. I mean, I'm I'm trying to be kind. I think that there's, I think there's just right from a science scientific standpoint. It's just nice to know things. Oh right? yeah, we like we, we, we just like to <laughs> know you. things, right? There's there doesn't have to be a purpose. I just I just want to understand. And then the the less kind and 
far more cynical perspective is so that we can say, see, I was right. We were here all along. It's, you know, the Abrahamic faiths have got it, right? We're Our God is right. the biggest God because it developed first, right? You all, right? All your cities belong to me kind of thing. And I... <laughs> um, <laughs> Was there an all your base are belong to us reference hidden in there that? There was, there was, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> For the, um, the discerning listener out there, there's also a hidden reference in our trailer from six months ago to that original <laughs> meme. But go on. Uh, all your promised land are belong to us. Go ahead. That's right. So uh, uh, that's a very cynical perspective that, that we're in charge, but I'm, I, I am wary of how we use data because as as Zach pointed out, the first thing that we might want to do is just be violent with it. And I'm I'm hesitant about that. I think we need to be very careful when we when we have information. So when when the scientific community says, ah, look what I found, the rest of us and the scientific community can say, that's marvelous. How do we handle this information together and kindly and as the society that we want to have and and I just want to throw this little this little population nugget out there. We don't again have a whole lot of information about how many Homo sapiens there were fifty thousand years ago, but there weren't very many, hmm. right? Uh, there's some people throw out numbers like fifty five thousand in the world, um, but we're not quite sure. But then we we do start seeing numbers. One number that I saw at about ten thousand years ago is five million. And we hit a billion people concurrently living, <sighs> concurrently living on the planet in the year 1800, give or take, right? maybe 1804. And we don't hit 2 billion people currently living until 123 years later in 1927. And here we are at the start of... 2020, and we're approaching 8 billion people. Yeah. Our Dunbar number is no longer 150, and it can't be. So how we understand the data that's showing us where we came from and what information that's telling us and how we made that leap to go from 150 to larger, where is our trust in there, I think is really crucial. It's, it's trying to figure out what what we're made of. That's what I look at this and say, what 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 does humanity and a humanness come down to? That's what I want to know. Hmm. Yeah, I'll throw another Kurt Vonnegut quote out there. Kurt Vonnegut's going to be my Thomas Paine this season, I guess. Oh. He says, we are we are what we pretend to be. So be careful what about what we pretend to be so that we are the stories that we tell about ourselves in our societies and be careful about the stories that you tell if you look at like i mentioned before the city states the polis of of greece in the what 8th century bc they were held together by um, national identity that was their story that they told about their society. They were Finians, they were Spartans, they were Corinthians, they, you know, they were their polis, their people. Some of them had some big gods, you know, we read later on about Artemis and Ephesus and whatnot, but they were their nationalistic identity. And the Lydians gave us currency. They told a story about trust and relationship and valuable metal. And that story got more city-states and more countries together. That expanded the story. When we tell stories about our, our religious faith, about the religious experiences that we have and that we try to codify, some of those stories were very small. They were very limited. They were, we have been given special information and we are the only ones who have it. And our story helps us to feel included, but not others. And then there are other stories like the one that Jesus told, where Jesus said that I have news that you're going to bring to Samaria and then out into the ends of the earth. The, the story that God gave to Abraham, that you are to be a blessing to bless all nations, that larger inclusive 
boundary busting stories, if your religious faith, if your big God in your mind helps you to include more of the seven and a half billion people, then I say that is a good and a useful story to tell today. If your religious story, if your faith, your God is one that makes small groups of committed people and excludes the huge swaths of humanity, then I think that is a regressive story and you would be better off not having it, as that's probably patronizing of me to say. But there have been some uh, some work done from Andrew Newberg in How God Changes Your Brain that that shows that people who hold sincere religious beliefs in an angry punitive God Mm -hmm. end up with what we may refer to as brain damage. There are people with less patience, less love, less understanding, less joy and happiness overall. People who believe in a loving God primarily, you know, perhaps a God who punishes, but who is primarily loving, end up living happier lives and being more well-adjusted in society. So you can look at the ways that neuropathways develop based on how you, what you believe in God. And those differences matter, not just in our societies, but for your individual brain, your life, and how you live it. This has been episode 22 of the Down the Wormhole podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, would you do me a favor and tell a friend about it this week? We'd also love to hear what this podcast has meant to you. So leave us a review or send us a message, however it works for you. You can find contact information, show notes, and more at downthewormhole.com. Make sure you join us next week as we welcome special guest Dr. Pete Enns as we talk about reading Genesis in light of human evolution and finding truth in the dissonance. And when somebody asks you why you spent hours of your life digging into these sorts of questions... From a science, scientific standpoint, it's just nice to know things. 